Okay, so uh, welcome uh, everybody uh, to this uh, second week of the of the school. Um, thank you very much for being here. Uh, so today uh, we are going to be have a different format compared to the ones we are used to from uh, last week. So today uh, is my uh, pleasure to introduce the lecturer of today, who is uh, Jordi Vasconte. Uh, Jordi is a professor of ecology and evolutionary biology uh, at the University of Zurich in Switzerland. And uh, his uh, um, research is mostly focused on ecological network and in particular on mutualistic networks. So you have, uh, as you know, uh, Jordi Basconte has uploaded two uh, record, pre-recorded lectures uh, that were available on uh, the website uh, starting last week. And uh, this session of today is um, a Q&A session. Uh, so it's an opportunity to discuss uh, with, uh, uh, with Jordi uh, the material presented in the lectures and I think I go also a little bit beyond uh, them. So thank you very much, uh, Jordi, for, for uh, pre recording the lectures and for being uh, with us. Thanks to you, Jacopo. It's really a pleasure and uh, welcome everybody. And so now we are uh, open to questions. So if you um, have any question on either of the two, uh, the two lectures, please use the uh, raise hand button uh, of Zoom or uh, write it in the chat. Or if you're following from YouTube, you can write it in the chat of YouTube. So uh, we have a uh, hand raised by Silvia. So Silvia, if you want to ask the question, please unmute and ask. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes. So I have a question uh, on the first uh, lecture concerning mm -hmm. how the nested structure emerges. Um, in fact, like in general, one could hypothesize that the structure could emerge either from the ecological dynamics or from the um, evolutionary dynamics, right? And mm -hmm. on Friday, we heard a lecture by Stefano Alesina that was uh, talking about community assembly. And we learned that there will be a structure in the interactions only if there was a structure in the original pool of species. So this would suggest that the nested structure can only emerge from the evolutionary dynamics. So could you comment on this? And is there any of your works where you dealt with um, how the nested structure can emerge? Yes. That's a great question. Uh, thanks for posing that. Um, I think that as we've learned more about uh, these ecological networks and, uh, and the suite of mechanisms that are compatible with, with the structure, we tend to move from uh, an, an initial focus where people uh, were picking up a particular mechanism to considering like simultaneous mechanisms um, uh, that can potentially be at work here. So early on, right after the first wave of studies describing the structure of these networks, people um, start focusing on particular mechanisms. For example, one of those is species abundance. So people realize that um, if most abundant species tend to uh, be more uh, available by chance, it's more likely that species would tend to interact with these more, more abundant than less abundant species. So this kind of neutral uh, approach become um, one important um, mechanism in generating networks. At the same time, other people were focusing on other aspects. For example, a phylogenetic signal is well known that there is this uh, phylogenetic signal meaning that species close in the phylogeny tend to play similar roles in the network of interactions. What this is suggesting is that past evolutionary history uh, may be important in understanding uh, contemporary patterns of network uh, built up. So for a while, as, um, as it tends to happen in science, it seemed like there was a little bit of a, of a, of a competition between um, specific um, mechanisms. I think where we are standing today 
is in a place where we recognize that there's a suite of mechanisms. There's not only one mechanism. So ecology certainly plays a role because um, species abundance, it's important in order to explain these patterns, but it, it, most likely it's, it's not enough. And it's true that this coexists with this um, evolutionary signal with trade matching, for example, which is another set of explanations that emphasize that trades are the currency that explains interactions. And therefore, for example, one trade would be the length of a pollinator stone. Another uh, trade could be the length of a, a, a plant's corolla, flower's cor corolla. And therefore, um, whether or not there's a matching between trades may be key in order to explain those interactions. So what I think it's now um, uh, the, 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 the state where we are is in trying to understand, not, not proving that this is the mechanism or that's the mechanism, but in trying to uh, weigh the relative importance of a series of mechanisms, always taking into account the phylogenetic structure, because in these comparative studies, one cannot forget that species are not independent units, but they um, uh, form part of, uh, of this uh, uh, of, of, of this process of uh, related species uh, coming uh, uh, from an ancestor or origin. So that's that's where I think we are right now. I think that uh, evolutionary mechanisms certainly are important, what you were emphasizing, but there are other set of mechanisms like, like ecological ones. And I don't think there's um, nothing wrong on that. I think, I think that as with many other things in, in science, uh, a pluralistic view uh, is most likely gonna gonna be at war. So yes, I would highlight uh, evolutionary mechanisms, uh, trade mechanisms, and, and and neutral or species abundance mechanisms. If I can ask just a, a, a little sure. clarification on this, like when you mentioned the importance of abundance, so are the species that are most uh, generalist typically the more abundant ones? Yes, that's something that uh, people. Uh, relies from an early stage. And if something the debate was, I mean, are species uh, more abundant because they are more uh, generalist or the other way around? So that's a little bit where the, the discussion was. But for, for, uh, uh, for, from very much uh, the early stage of these studies on ecological networks, and in particular, these mutualistic networks, it was, uh, it was clear, and, and, and particularly I'm thinking about the Great War by, by Diego Vázquez in Argentina and colleagues, that um, abundance was, was, really, was really important. The thing, though, is that, um, uh, for example, going back to our own work, we had um, a paper laid by a former student, um, uh, um, uh, Abe Krishna, that uh, proved with a simple model that while abundance is important, when you combine abundance with, with, um, with trade matching, the fit to the data is, is even higher. Great. So, uh, Silvia, you wanted to follow up or? No, I'm fine. Thank you very much Thanks. for the answer. Great. So there is a, um, a question from uh, uh, Washington, Taylor. Yeah, hi, thanks. Yeah, I thought your lecture was very interesting. You found some, there's some nice, clear and simple ways of uh, starting to address some really interesting and deep questions. I had actually two uh, somewhat unrelated questions. Maybe I'll throw both of them at you and you can choose which one or, or uh, address them in whichever order you want. So one is you focused on climate as a driver of extinction events and as kind of a primary thing throughout your lecture. But as I'm sure you're, you're very well aware, you know, mo most of the things currently driving species extinction are other things like habitat loss you know, human use of ecosystems, pollution, invasive species, and things like that. So the first question is whether um, those would have a similar impact or whether there are some climate specific signatures in what you were describing. Um, and then the second question is, um, when you describe these, these essentially two level networks, I mean, of course, in a real ecosystem, there's all kinds of very subtle other species playing niche roles that are mediating interactions and maybe playing key roles as, uh, you know, in, in all kinds of places in the, in the system. So I'm wondering whether that you've explored whether there's any sense in which these networks you have are robust against intermediate species that are involved in the, in the system going extinct or you know how, how that plays in the, the missing pieces that you don't have in the network so those are sort of two questions yes this these are very great uh, questions 
Going back to the first one, you're totally right. I mean, uh, climate change is just one driver of global environmental change, the other being uh, habitat fragmentation or uh, uh, nitrogen deposition and, and so on. Um, while our focus was here, probably, probably the, um, the reason we're focusing on climate change is for historical reasons, because from early on, there was this attempt of bridging between these uh, uh, somehow um, uh, distant approaches, one the network approach and the other the, the, the climate, um, climate change ecology, right? So uh, to some extent, focus, focusing on climate uh, uh, was um, a consequence of uh, these two uh, different approaches. Uh, but um, there's been a previous work uh, by, by, by other people who focus on, on habitat uh, transformation. Some of this work is, is theoretical using models of habitat loss, habitat fragmentations, and looking at uh, what's the rate and shape of, of network uh, collapse. And um, I, I would say, I would, I would expect finding the, the, the the same type of uh, uh, qualitative results. I don't think those results were quite specific about, about climate in terms of the rate and shape of collapse, in terms of like uh, uh, finding this uh, phylogenetic signal or, or having a moment where the, the, the rules of the game, so to speak, change. And then uh, uh, we're focusing uh, different species from the, from the phylogenetic tree. So I, I, I would say those are... Uh, quite uh, general results, although to be totally honest, only um, a subset of these questions uh, have been addressed using other drivers of climate change. So here I'm, uh, I'm kind of uh, telling a little bit my, my gut feeling. For example, the one it's for sure similar is this uh, kind of abrupt collapse, this idea that the, the consequence as, as, as we are moving through this um, axis of uh, global environmental change, the thing that early on, nothing seems to change too much up to a point where suddenly there's a, a collapse. That's the kind of result that different people have seen when looking at different, at different drivers, right? Uh, the other ones, uh, I'm not so uh, well aware of studies, the, the ones looking, for example, at, at how functional diversity is eroded or, or um, evolutionary history is eroded, but my gut feeling would be that these are quite, have to be quite general uh, uh, consequences. So I would expect a similar kind of signal. Mm -hmm. um, in, in relation to the other question, that, that's very interesting. It's true that um, one should expect having this kind of, uh, if you want keystone species, species that play uh, a major role in bringing the network, um, the network together. And uh, that's, that's uh, a piece of research that has focus on that, but in my view, it's more a static one. For example, research looking at the modularity or, or compartmentalization of these networks, this research tends to look not only at this tendency uh, to be organizing modules, but also at the role that different uh, species play, and in particular, this role by a few species in, 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 in in bridging across different modules in being the sort of, of the glue that keeps this module uh, together. Now, if, um, if I understood your, your question correctly, you, you were asking whether some studies have focus on what happens when, when these species disappear, right? And, um, and um, I, ca I can think of, of a study uh, that was uh, looking at, um, at, 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 at a genetic diversity of, of, of some of these species that emphasize this thing that uh, uh, once you remove one of these species, you can have a major change because suddenly you can have a network that previously was more or less cohesive. And now you have like a, a collection of, of, of different networks. Great, no thanks. Those are great answers to both questions. And on the second question, I guess one, if I could just go a little further on that. So I guess one of the things I was also asking about there was, you have this database of interactions between different species in these different habitats. And I guess I'm wondering, you know, probably there are important species that were missed in each of those databases. So for instance, you may have 73 species in a given area, but there may be another 30 species that really play a keystone role. So part of the question is, even if you missed some of those key species and those were somehow just encoded uh, secretly in the interactions, are the, are the results that you're getting robust against, say, replacing the network with one where you imagine that you only know about a, sub, a subset of the species 
and then test the same hypotheses. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're totally right. And that's the kind of, um, uh, I would say that encapsulates uh, a, a series of criticism that uh, was about uh, using these uh, large database studies where, you know, I mean, um, it was a, a nice attempt in the sense of looking at generality, but uh, there are trade-offs and the uh, part of the consequence of that. And, and I, I, I think it's a fair point, part of the consequence of people who were more critical about um, our work and the work by, by many others for the, same, uh, for the same sake, was that each of these networks has been compiled by a different uh, author or a different team spending different time or using slightly different methodologies and therefore um, in the same way that when looking at um, studies on species diversity, it's very clear now, pretty much everybody knows and understands that we, we should use uh, rarefaction curves. We were not at this stage. And that, uh, that uh, uh, arise some questions about the value of this generality. Now there's been, uh, um, as, as, as the, the field mature, and this kind of studies become a little bit more, more mature, there has been already a subset of those that start using similar methodologies and, and in particular use these uh, rarefaction curves. And this allows two things. First, it, it allows to focus on the smaller subset of networks that have been sampled uh, enough, so have a similar level of sampling and then focusing on, on those, but also like looking at how these properties may change across a, a, a gradient in, in sampling. And there are properties that may uh, vary quite a lot, but some of these properties do not vary uh, that much. Like in particular, that nested structure I was emphasizing during that particular um, uh, first talk, it's one that it's a little bit like the different peels of, of an onion, right? Essentially, you have this, this uh, core of, of generalist species and then these few um, generalists. Thing is that if you sample more, you start having a longer tail of a species. And, and normally those species tend to be uh, specialists and to be uh, uh, less common species, that, but also they tend to attach to the most generalists. So depending on the type of, of, of um, dimension of a structure view one or perspective, this may not uh, depend that much on, on, um, on the level of sampling. But in general, I think that's a poor, a poor answer. And I think that now what we should try to do is every new study try to have a sort of uh, rarefaction rare curves. And people can do that in the same way that we look at how many different species we have when we sample 100, 500, 1,000 individuals. We can do the same, for example, with the number of interactions. And oftentimes, we have enough of a sample that people consider a little bit of an uh, asymptote. Mm -hmm. Great, thanks a lot. My pleasure. Uh, great. So the next one in line is uh, uh, Alfonso. So Alfonso, please uh, um, unmute yourself. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for your great lecture. And my my first question is: uh, Can the mutualistic networks account for weighted interac interaction between plants and insects. And if, in that case, uh, how much the distribution of these weights might change uh, the results uh, or the number of a species, the maximum number of a species supported by the network or the change of extinctions in case that in the case of non-random uh, extinction, like the co-extinction that you talk about in the lecture. And my second question, I just come up with the, that question uh, recently, is that is there a relation of in like uh, generalist species tend to be more abundant? My, my, my question is related with the species abundance distribution, if the, there are a relation between the species abundance distribution of a community and the network structure. Very good, a uh, very good uh, set of questions. Let me start by, by the second one. The answer is, is yes, and some of these uh, 
uh, approaches we were referring to uh, a few minutes ago in terms of like uh, checking the relative role of a, of a different uh, mechanisms in explaining network structure. One of those, this kind of a neutral approach was using these observed skew uh, species abundance relationships and then um, for the plants on one hand, for the animals on the other, and then assuming that the probability of drawing an interaction is going to be proportional to the to the product of this species abundance. So it's, it's kind of simultaneously taking into account both the skew distribution for both sets, right? And um, when one does something like that, you, you come up with a network of, of interactions that tends to be similar than um, the one we observe uh, in nature. So people would tend to think, okay, that's, uh, uh, that, that kind of supports the idea that uh, neutral processes, species abundance is certainly important. Again, as I said, when you have a model that takes into account this and other factors, you can get an even uh, a better fit, which uh, tends to support the idea that there's not only one mechanism, but most likely a suite, a suite of, of mechanisms. So you are totally right. Species abundance and, and the particular uh, empirical distributions is something that may be uh, very important and has been empirically used in order to um, come up with a expectation of these network of interactions and then matching that expectation with the, with the observed one. I don't know if that answered your, your question. Yes, I, I think that, that answered my question. Lovely. Then in, in, in regards to the first one, uh, you are totally right. I think um, my talk, you probably realize that my, uh, I mean, when I give this talk on mutualistic networks, now it's a talk that uh, spans uh, now 20 years. So early on, when we were mainly looking at the structure, I was um, going through different levels of structure and focusing on, on interaction strength. As, as more results were packed, I, I, I tend to reduce the focus on, on structure and just focus on that particular dimension, the nested one, but you are totally right. And although early on, the first set of, of papers were looking at binary data, and that refers to, for example, this nested pattern I, I was talking about, but also these connectivity distributions, whether they are they follow power law or a truncated power law or an exponential that was like the kind of things people in network research were doing at the same at the, at the, at the time. Um, I mean, a few people, again, uh, were critical about that and they would say that, okay, all the results may be uh, uh, meaningful without like considering embracing the fact that there may be a huge variability in the wave in the strength of those interactions. And actually, there was uh, a few studies that were looking at the structure, but using weighted data. In that big repository I, I, I mentioned during my, my talk, uh, right now there's almost half of these networks that contain information not only on who interacts with whom, but on the relative weight of this interaction. Oftentimes, this is uh, the surrogate of, of um, frequency of interactions is used or, or number of fruits uh, removed, for example, things among those lines. So there's this kind of information. And some of these studies describing network structure were focusing on that component. For example, they were looking at the dependence of an animal in a plant. Like, uh, for, and, and they were focusing or they were highlighting this idea of a, a symmetry in the interaction which can be also observed in binary data. One of the results of a nested pattern is this asymmetry in the sense that specialists tend to interact with the most generalists. Now, when you look at weighted network, you can see that this also happens in, the, in, the, in a pairwise scale. So like, for example, a plant that depends very much on an animal for, um, for uh, its pollination, norm normally you encounter that the animal depends very little on that particular plant. So some of the results you can still see uh, when you move from binary to weighted networks. And other results only make sense or only kind of tools or approaches when you have um, a, a weighted network. So overall, um, yes, you have this kind of information. You can address new questions that you could not with a, with a binary data. Uh, and a, a few questions you can check with both. And uh, I would say you tend to find like uh, similar, uh, similar uh, patterns. 
Great, uh, Alfonso. You have a follow-up or? No, I, I think that that answers was really nice. So thank you very much. Thanks to you for the question. Great. So uh, next in line is uh, Violeta. Uh, yes. Uh, hi. Hello. Uh, hi, Violeta. Thank you, Jordi. <laughs> Hello. Uh, yes, my question is uh, about the uh, structural stability. More precisely, when you uh, place the mutualistic empirical network in the figure whose axes are nestedness and the mutualistic uh, trade off. Yeah. There, okay, for me, it's crystal clear how uh, do you infer the nestedness of the network? You just measure it with some algorithm. But uh, what about the mutualistic trade off? I, I mean, uh, how have you inferred this mutualistic trade-off? Because then if you see the equations, the generalized Lotka Volter equations, there the, the parameter space is multidimensional and very, very wide. So I suppose that you just chose certain parameters, but uh, can we be sure that uh, the, the, about the general, generality of, of the results doing, doing that? Yes, in terms of how uh, one does this, on one hand, you have for these uh, weighted networks, you have empirical information. And essentially, that's information that relates uh, the degree, how many species a focal species interact with, that may be two, five, or 10 species. But you also have information on the weight of each one of these interactions, right? So this is information that you have empirically from the network. So that, that means that you can determine where the point is in that figure, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of how to um, explore, it's very much similar than with nestedness. I mean, uh, with nestedness, uh, you take the network as it is, and then you randomize that uh, with a series of assumptions. Normally, you, you tend to preserve total number of plants, total number of animals, uh, total number of interactions, and approximately who uh, uh, how many interactions each species has. With the trade, obviously, a bit the same. You could have like um, a randomization where you maintain the degree of each species, right? You maintain like uh, uh, like the number of interactions they have, but, but you can shuffle the weights of each one of those interactions. So that would allow you to explore that axis in, in mm -hmm. parameter space. But anyway, that axis is also related with the intrinsic both weight of the species and also the competitions parameter. So all well, of that, those that, that axis, um, it's it's not related to anything else because it's it's the way you define it. You define an axis like being only a value of nestedness, and then it's only structural, and you can change it. What it's related to these other parameters, and in particular to growth rates, which is this was the the variable we we're looking at, is in terms of the measure of structural stability. So on one hand, you have uh, parameters that define the structure, the structure of the network, and then you use um, uh, growth rates as a way to quantify uh, how much variability in those growth rates the model can cope with before one or more species is driven extinct. Mm -hmm. Okay, I so there's a little bit of an uncoupling, no? Some of these uh, variables of, of network structure are, are just used to, to show uh, how much variability you could have. And then for each level of variability, uh, the demographic uh, parameters are used in order to explain uh, the, the, the range in growth rates in this case in particular. So you, you choose like the, 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 the center of this uh, domain, the center where uh, this domain of feasibility, where all species can coexist, there's, there's ways by which you can focus on, on that center. And then you um, start uh, perturbing growth rates, changing growth rates, increasing, 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 up to the point where one or more species uh, disappear. So there's a little bit of a decoupling on how you treat these different, um, different parameters. Okay, but when, sorry, just the last question, yeah, but yeah, when, sure. when you are uh, varying the range of the intrinsic growth rate, there in your equations, you must fix uh, the other betas and, and yes. gammas. So, yes. it, it, so maybe it happens that for 
those certain parameters of gamma and, and betas, your intrinsic growth rate behaves in some way, but maybe there's a tiny region where they don't. So is that actually important or not? Yes, you are totally right. And to be, uh, uh, I mean, to make a long story short, uh, essentially that's for a specific values of, of the other parameters. One, what one can do is then repeat the analysis for a, 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 another value for each one of these parameters. So this gives you an idea of how uh, robust results are for variation in the other parameters. But to be, uh, to be honest with you, essentially that's more like, okay, you fix the other parameters and then you, you focus on variability on growth rates. And yes, you cannot rule out the possibility that there, there may be some combination of parameters where, 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 where now uh, you, you could have a, a, a slightly larger or, or, or a smaller range of conditions compatible with, with feasibility. You are right. It's, it's, a, it's a very complex uh, problem just because of the yes. multidimensional uh, lithium parameters. So to some extent, you, 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 you fix some of the parameters and then you focus on, on growth rate. So it's, it's, if you want, it's a partial account of the much more complex variability in parameter space. Okay, no, but thank you. Thank you very much. Very Great. interesting. <laughs> Great, thanks a lot for the questions. So the next in line is uh, Martina. Hi, hello, and Hi, thank you for, for your lectures. Uh, so one is, a, I have two questions. One is a clarification, the other one is more general. So maybe I'll start with clarif the clarification. So when you were talking about extinctions that were driven by climate uh, compared to the secondary extinctions that are driven by uh, interactions, mm -hmm. uh, you had those uh, um, phylogenetic trees uh, and with the circles. Uh, and uh, you were saying that you can predict the, um, let's say the um, uh, direct extinctions uh, with the geographic location, where, whether you predict the others with the traits. And I was wondering, uh, maybe it's completely wrong. Never but... Sorry, just to be precise, the, the single most important variable in explaining coextinction is what we call network ID, so a, a property of the network, yes. Okay, and I, and I was wondering whether, okay, if you have interactions, uh, you're supposed to you have them in the same location. So I was wondering how can you get these, uh, let's say, switch in the first predictor? Uh, essentially, the way is uh, by using these uh, generalized linear models where you can have different factors. Uh, one is a geographic location. The other, it's, it's, it's a factor called a network ID, so a, a property of the network which it's, it's unique and it, it's not affected by the others. And then through this kind of a statistical approach, you can, um, uh, you can waive the relative contribution of one of these uh, uh, variables accounting for the other ones. So it's a way by which you can focus on the relative role of geographic location while keeping into account, uh, if you want keeping fixed, the, 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 the role of, of network ID. That's one component. And the other one is, uh, or, or the, the complement to that, is by using um, what's called a, a, a Kaikis information criteria, because other things being equal, I mean, the more variables you have in the in a model, right, the better it gets, but- You have to penalize it. To some extent, it's, it's, it's an artifact or, or just a corollary of, uh, of having more variables. So the idea is to really uh, uh, um, focus on the variables, right, that uh, explain um, uh, um, the variability in a model, uh, taking into account the, the number of variables or the dimensionality of, of, of the model itself. So that's a kind of a statistical approach uh, to uh, come up with this kind of, uh, kind of results. So essentially, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, uh, statistically, you can do that. Even when you have several variables, uh, these kind of models allow you to focus on one variable at the time and kind of uh, yeah. give, give, give you the relative relevance of that variable while keeping the others um, uh, constant. And also the interaction, because sometimes then, uh, the interaction between uh, between factors or variables. So sometimes it's not just that uh, uh, variable uh, uh, X or, or variable Y are important, but sometimes you can also find a significant um, 
interaction between these two variables. And so given that it's, uh, these models, so it, the network ID is in the fixed part or in the random part? That's a good point. To be honest, now I don't remember if we treat it as a, as a random factor. Um, okay. This I cannot remember now. But, um, no, it's fine. I can I can read the paper from. Yes, I mean I'm sure the 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 details are are there are there, and um, because that that that's a very interesting thing, and it's not trivial the way um, uh, people who are um, uh, uh, really knowledgeable about these these models, the the way they treat um, these um, these uh, factors as either a random or a fix, that depends very much on the structure of the question, but also a little bit the constraints or the limitations of, of the data. So again, uh, if you are interested, details are, are there. I, I, I just do not remember now. OK, OK. Uh, and the other one is more general. So you, you find this uh, very nice relationship between nestedness and biodiversity. And uh, do you know what happens if you have modularity on the x-axis? That's a very good point. I, I, we, we've not really checked that in the context of that uh, of that framework. Um, so I cannot give you like a, a, a solid answer to that question just because we did not check. Obviously, one could think about these two dimensions of network structure not being totally independent, but somehow related. And although it's not perfect relationship, people tend to assume that the, the higher the nestedness, the lower modularity. That's not necessarily the case because that depends on a level of connectivity. So below, below that threshold of connectivity for low connectivities, you actually find a, a, a positive relationship. You, you, you find the networks which are more nested, they are also more modular. But when, when the network um, is, uh, is well connected, you find this kind of inverse relationship. So one could conclude that because of that, uh, you would find uh, the opposite sort of, 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 of trend. Okay, thank you. My pleasure. Great, so, um, uh, Martina, okay, no, I think, uh, okay. So we can move on with uh, Sri uh, Rama. Thank you, Professor, for your talks. Am I audible? I hope I'm audible. Hello? Hi. Yes, yeah, sorry, I, I could not hear you very well. Sorry, no, am I audible? Uh, yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, so actually I have a general question. Suppose if you take a generalist predators or anything, they have some preferential structure. So there's something like optimal for edges. So what happens is every time the uh, network structure changes because they can prefer one prey or another prey. So the network becomes a dynamics. Yes. So how this dynamic network can be modeled generally? That's an excellent point. Uh, you are totally right. And one of the uh, limitations of, of the last part of my talk, talking about these uh, models of climate change, is that we were not taking into account that. So essentially, in this kind of uh, approach, and also the approach by, by, by many others, the thing is that uh, once a species runs out of, of, of resources or, or the fraction of resources disappear, those species have a higher probability of being driven uh, co-extinct. And uh, we know that things are a little bit more complicated because, as you already point out, uh, there is a trophic uh, flexibility. The fact that some species, whenever their favorite prey items uh, uh, are not abandoned enough, they can shift to, to um, another one. So, I mean... To my knowledge, the very first person who put um, brought this forward was Mikio Kondo, a, th a, a theoretical ecologist based in Japan, that in a paper in, in science, that's probably now 15, uh, about 15 years uh, ago, uh, proved that this flexibility can uh, certainly shift. And, and he was focusing on the relationship between stability and complexity. It can, it can be shifted. So when you have uh, trophic flexibility, you can see that uh, more uh, complex uh, food webs tend to be more, um, more uh, stable. Also in the context of mutualistic networks, uh, people and, and Fernanda Baldovinos, it's, a, it's a, a good example, have shown that this uh, relationship between stability and complexity can largely uh, uh, change through that uh, trophic flexibility. So I would say that um, 
the sort of models that we and others have used, ignoring traffic flexibility, would be a sort of worst case scenario. Whenever you have a traffic flexibility, things uh, uh, become a little bit better. But I would say that some of the qualitative results, for example, the, the existence of, of these tipping points are still there, only that you can shift the tipping point uh, to higher values of habitat loss or, or, or species extinctions and things like, like that. I think now the question though, is how to really bring a biological informed a model of, 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 um, of network rewiring. This is what uh, we are trying to do now in the lab with uh, Marilia Gallarza. And I think that, again, that phylogenetic signal can be key here. The fact that, okay, although uh, there's a potential for uh, rewiring, oftentimes this is not going to be random. So uh, uh, any species will most likely not have the possibility to shift to any other item. But we think that it may be a good, um, uh, uh, a good starting point to consider phylogenetic signal, me meaning that if one species runs out of, of uh, resources, most likely may, uh, may shift towards resources that uh, a species close in the phylogeny uh, depends on. So I think, I think that would be a good uh, way to start uh, introducing this rewiring a little bit uh, in a more biologically informed way than just assuming every species has a probability to rewire with any other species randomly picked in the community. Uh, can I add one thing? Generally, most of this uh, optimal phrasing is something, suppose they're not able to uh, see that if there is not referring, they're not, uh, the feeding may not be giving the uh, required growth or anything, they will divert to another species. So that means the uh, something like uh, uh, suppose if, if they are seeing that uh, we are having a lot of energy we are uh, uh, spending in time of predation, but we are not getting lo uh, required energy to our growth, then we have to shift for another species. So how can you do this? Uh, uh, that is what actually my question. I mean, I don't know I'm able to properly convey that or not. Because I'm not a biologist, I'm a mathematician, I'm working in this area, so. Yeah, I think it's a very good point. I mean, to be, to be honest, we know very little about that. And the reason is, again, because this, this kind of studies have gone uh, quite independent from each other. A little bit, I was emphasizing that independence between network research and climate change research, right? And that was a little bit of the rationale for, uh, for us trying to bridge them. Uh, another another uh, big gap, uh, exists between these models of uh, or this approach of ecological networks that tend to be quite uh, static and this optimal foraging which obviously emphasized a dynamic component. No? I think um, it would be a very interesting uh, uh, direction to try to bridge those and for example try to see what would be the predictions, what would come up out of these uh, basic ideas of optimal foraging. So for example, allowing like a, a few species of animals to forage, forage in a, on a given uh, um, landscape, and then trying to see how out of these basic rules of optimal foraging, what kind of network structure would, would, would arise. I think there's a little bit of that. I, I seem to recall uh, a paper uh, probably by, by Morales and perhaps uh, Diego Vázquez as well. Uh, I may be wrong, but I think I think these are the, the authors who tried to do that. And, and that was uh, certainly very, very interesting. But I think there's there's uh, lots of room to kind of expand this this kind of bridging between optimal foraging and, and network structure. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Uh, great. So we are going at very high pace <laughs> here. So there is another question by uh, Ankit. Uh, hi. Hello. Yeah. Thank you for this very broad survey of uh, mutualistic networks. So I had a question regarding, uh, like, which is somewhat related to May's result of stability in large, complex ecosystems. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, obviously, he looks at uh, like entirely random networks, but let's say if you talk about large uh, mutualistic networks, where you have some asymmetry between the number of plants and, and the animals, 
like let's say there are very few plants but many animals which uh, like depend on these uh, uh, plants so in that case like is there a theoretical result of like stability in the same sense as uh, may or like yeah or like is it difficult to like define that because i guess in such a setting you would have a lot of negative interactions instead of like just uh, totally random interactions yeah. what what do you mean by negative interactions non non random just uh, non random yeah, yeah random negative interactions but they don't sum up to zero i mean like the interactions of the entire matrix yeah yes that that's a very good point you you are totally right i mean uh, bob bob's may great paper has to be has to be seen as like a baseline expectation so some some of the criticism the paper had actually uh, did not arise uh, because of the paper itself but our our uh, faulty way of interpreting that that paper so we could not interpret that may said that most complex communities have to be unstable rather what he said is that our baseline expectation if communities were randomly organized is that there's a limit to to uh, uh, complexity and therefore i think that paper was uh, uh, extremely influential in 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 shaping the field in many directions one of those was just asking ourselves what may be those uh, mechanisms or these uh, dimensions of a structure that can help reconcile being complex and being uh, stable so yeah there's um, our 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 original work on um, trying to bridge between uh, this uh, network structure and, and stability that was uh, uh, our our science paper in 2006 we tried to do that in in following um, a very similar approach than than uh, bob bob may with lots of limitations i mean that was uh, our first attempt and uh, therefore we had to simplify a lot of things and but what what i want to emphasize in, in the context of your question is that yes you come up with a, a, um, an equation for the uh, linear stability and feasibility condition for both being feasible and linearly stable that very much resembles uh, 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 bob may essentially you have in bob may you have that the average uh, strength of interactions has to be lower than an amount amount that involves number of species and, and connectivity so what you have here it's a similar thing but instead of having like um, the average strength of interactions you have the average product of the strength of interaction of the animal and the strength of interaction of the, of the plant and this is what has to be less than an amount and that uh, we we that allow us to to predict that what's relevant in these mutualistic networks is that either you have uh, species that depend very little on others or when one species depends a lot on a second that second this depends very little in the one so even when one term is, is large if the other is very very small the product still remains uh, remains uh, sm small so that would be an example of a very similar kind of criteria than uh, bob may but uh, it, it had some interesting variability in that variability allow us to start like thinking about um, how these dependencies of a plant and an animal and the animal on that plant uh, have to be rearranged to keep a stable communities. Yeah, thanks. I'll also look at your uh, paper. Into the Lovely, thank you. Thanks. Great. So uh, is there any other question? I don't see anyone uh, with the uh, raise hand uh, in the participant list, uh, and no one, no question in the chat. Uh, but we had a fifty-minute, very intense uh, question session. So I think that if uh, no one has a question, we can uh, 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 move forward. Great. Well, I think it was this was a sort of uh, experiment for us to have these pre-record sessions uh, plus questions, but I uh, personally think it worked very, very well. Uh, and I'd like to, thanks, uh, to thank uh, Jordi for being with us and uh, for uh, answer answering uh, all the questions as well as uh, pre-recording the lectures. Thank, thanks, uh, Jacopo, and thanks any uh, every one of you. I think you come up with uh, extremely good questions, and I think 
uh, a proof of that is that these are the questions that we are encountered when trying to publish papers. So in that regard, I, I, I think that uh, you are thinking um, very well. So I, I've, I've, I've really enjoyed and, and had a great time. So I like just to add that feel free to email if, if some of these ideas uh, uh, start developing or you have further uh, a question. So just uh, drop an email and uh, it would be my pleasure to keep uh, discussing some, some of these ideas. And best luck uh, to every, every one of you. Hopefully you have a nice, uh, a nice uh, 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 school and, uh, and, a great, uh, and a great career. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Jordi, also for uh, your availability. And uh, so what we're going to do now uh, before the next lecture, which is, it will start in uh, about 20 minutes, is that we're going to split again in breakout rooms. Uh, so feel free to uh, chat uh, with uh, whoever you are randomly assigned to. Uh, if you have uh, uh, the uh, version uh, of Zoom 5 or later, I remember you that um, remind you that you can also switch uh, breakout rooms. So if you find someone you want to chat uh, with or a friend uh, you have not seen for a while, you can also do that. So uh, we'll see uh, each other back to the main, main uh, meeting rooms in 22 minutes. Thank you very much.
welcome uh, everybody. Uh, so if you are uh, following from uh, YouTube, uh, we are starting in uh, uh, about one minute. Um, in the meanwhile, we are waiting all the participants uh, following on Zoom to come back from the uh, breakout rooms. Um, so they should be uh, joining back in uh, about uh, 30 seconds now. Uh, so just a, uh, a reminder for those following from YouTube, if you want to ask question, uh, you can uh, use the uh, chat uh, on YouTube and I'll uh, read the, the question from, uh, I'll collect questions and read them uh, from you. Um, okay, so I think that um, everybody should be uh, back when I finish this sentence. <laughs> uh, yes, okay. I think uh, everybody is back to the main uh, meeting room. So uh, just uh, as a reminder, uh, I mean, I'm sure you are pretty, um, uh, uh, you know pretty well these uh, few rules. So if you want to ask a question, you can either post it in the chat or use the raise hand button. Uh, under participants, three dots, raise hand. Uh, so please uh, do that if you want to ask questions and uh, uh, I'll make sure you have an opportunity to do so. So before we start with the, the, the second lecture of today, I'd like to remind everybody that tomorrow um, at um, uh, 3.45 p.m. Italian time, we are gonna have another Q&A session as the one that just uh, finished uh, with uh, um, uh, James O'Dwyer. So there are two lectures by James O'Dwyer that are uh, available on the uh, uh, school uh, website. So please watch them in advance and come to tomorrow's session with uh, questions. So that's the end of all the announcements I had to make. So uh, I'd like to welcome again uh, Marino Gatto who is giving the second lecture uh, out of three. So please, Marino, if you, thanks for being with us. And if you want to share uh, slides, uh, please go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Jacopo. And uh, good afternoon to the Italians, as usual, good evening and good morning to the other people from all around the world. So let me start by sharing my screen. And okay, no, let me share. Oh, desktop, and then let me go. My presentation. Uh, so this is actually the second part, uh, uh, models of disease um, ecology. And uh, as you may remember, uh, today is devoted to the, the general topic of macroparasites. Uh, um, so a brief introduction to the, the basics. Uh, and then I will illustrate our work on schistosomiasis in, um, in Senegal. So uh, you may remember this slide where I uh, introduced micro and macro parasites, so the difference in terms of modeling and uh, macro parasites with respect to micro are characterized by lifetime, which is comparable to their host's lifetime. So their dynamics cannot be neglected. Also, of course, they are larger macro parasites, so you can uh, actually count them uh, in a way in many cases. So you, you can look at the, the load of the parasites uh, inside each host uh, and uh, count uh, the number of uh, parasites. Now, the, the, the life cycles uh, I am uh, going to consider well, the one on the left is the simple, the simple cycle. Um, for instance, the um, a roundworm or a, a nematode, and you see that uh, um, um, that pig is ingesting the eggs, uh, and then the eggs will develop inside uh, uh, the pig, and then they will become adult, uh, 
and they uh, would produce uh, more eggs and then uh, um, these eggs will be defecated in the environment and then the infection goes on that way with another pig uh, eating the eggs and so on and so on. On the right, you have a more complex uh, life cycle, which is actually um, the also um, the life cycle of schistosomiasis, um, of which I am going to speak uh, later on, because in that case, you have two hosts. So you have um, the human host, or in, uh, in this case, the cattle. And um, in that case, um, it is uh, different. There is a stage called the circarial stage. And um, this stage will uh, penetrate in general the skin of the host. So we'll get inside the host and then uh, again, uh, uh, the adults will develop inside the host and then they will reproduce inside the host, the main host, I mean, in a way. And then uh, eggs will be produced. The egg, these eggs will actually hatch and produce another stage with a call Miracidium. And uh, this Miracidia will actually infect another host, uh, a snail, in this case, in, this, in the case of Fasciolopsis buschi. And um, so uh, in the, then the, 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 there are other stages inside, uh, inside the snails. And then finally, the snails will uh, release the Miracidia and the Cercaria, and then the, the cycle will go on. But without the snails, uh, um, the, the disease cannot establish. And on the other hand, without the cattle, without the human host, the, the, the disease cannot establish its snail either. So they are necessary, both, uh, both hosts are necessary. And we will uh, first start of, obviously from the simple life cycle and uh, then we will proceed to the more complex uh, life cycle. So first of all, I, I told you that in, uh, in, in macroparasites, in many cases, you can count them. And here you see um, four examples. Uh, so for instance, uh, the, the perch, and this is a tapeworm inside the perch, and you can count the burden. So some of the perches have zero parasites, some have one, one parasite, some have two parasites, and so on and so on, okay. Now you can do the same with a completely different parasite. In this case, it is a, a fly, a stinging fly, and these are uh, the reindeer. And of course, in, in this case, the number of parasite per host is, is much larger. And so, uh, well, what you do, you do a histogram. And again, you see that there are some uh, reindeer without any parasite and then, uh, okay. You, you bin the number of parasites and you have that Instagram. Uh, uh, here is instead a, a starling and in, in that case it is a nematode and also it is a nematode for, for the frogs. Um, and you see that the, the, the histogram of the parasite burden uh, is it, it's quite burden, it's quite, quite uh, this burden is quite, quite different. Uh, so, I mean, the shape, the kind, the kind of, of shape, and in some cases you uh, see, for instance, typically in the case of frog, what we call an over dispersion with uh, a few hosts carrying a lot of parasites and, and many hosts without any parasite. Okay, so that, that, uh, that uh, typical, typical structure of the word in, in many cases. So it would be nice to, to find um, a way to statistically describe the, this burden. And um, um, well, the first thing you, you might think about is the, uh, for instance, a, a simple uh, binomial distribution where R, the number of parasites and you, uh, uh, P is the probability of having parasite, uh, hosting a parasite. And uh, well, you know, the binomial distribution is correct, right? Actually by under, what we call under dispersion. 
because if we consider the mean and the variance, then the variance is smaller than the mean, smaller or equal. It is equal to uh, the mean uh, when you go to the limit for uh, the number of trials going to infinity and the probability of hosting the parasite going to zero so that n times p converges to a constant. And then you have a Poisson distribution. In the Poisson distribution, the mean is equal to the variance. Uh, but actually, in many, in, uh, in, in many cases, uh, you don't have um, variance equal to the mean, but you have a variance which is larger than the mean. That's why uh, usually the most appropriate distribution is the, the negative uh, binomial. Uh, it is more flexible. Of course, it has uh, one more parameter with uh, respect to, uh, to the binomial or if you like uh, the, uh, the Poisson distribution. And uh, um, it is this parameter K, which is a parameter of clumping and the smaller is K and uh, the larger the over dispersion. Because in, 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 uh, in fact, uh, you, 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 you can prove that the variance is equal to the mean plus the square of the mean divided by this parameter K. So you see that if this parameter is very large, uh, practically you have a Poisson distribution with a variance equal to the mean, then with k equal to five, you have an, an aggregated distribution. Um, and you, you may remember that, uh, uh, for instance, well, I say this one is kind of aggregated, k equal to one in this case. And um, well, uh, for instance, k um, is it's smaller than one, you have a highly aggregated uh, distribution. So it, it is um, very, uh, very popular, let's say, to use a negative dynamic distribution as a flexible uh, distribution with just two parameters. That you, that you, if you adjust these two parameters, you can reasonably fit um, the parasite load. And that would be useful for the simple model I am going to show uh, to you. So it is a simple model where you have a simple uh, cycle um, where you have the host number or the host uh, density, if you like number, for instance, of pigs per uh, square kilometer or number of deer per square kilometer. And P is the alert parasite number or uh, density, if you like. Of course, the parasite burden, what I want to call is P divided by H in the average. So total number of parasites divided by total number of hosts, and that will give you the average, the average burden. But actually, each host uh, might have a different, might host a different number of, of parasites, zero, one, two, three, et cetera. So now let me also introduce the number of uh, free living stages, for instance, larvae or eggs, if you like. And then we can write down uh, two differential equations, one for the host and the one for the parasite. And then uh, the one for the host will be the birth rate minus the death rate times the host, no disease. But if there is a disease, then what happens? Well. Let's first suppose that uh, if you carry a lot of parasites, your mortality is larger. So let me call alpha the additional mortality caused by one parasite. So if you carry I parasites, there is an extra mortality alpha I. Now, if you consider the whole population and you consider the distribution, PI, probability that one host um, carries I parasites, you see that this is actually the um, average mortality and then you multiply by H and then you have the dynamics for the host. As for the parasites, well, uh, each host might, uh, you know, ingest a certain number of, large, of larvae, then the parasite will have their own, um, let's say, intrinsic natural uh, death rate. But there's another thing, 
anytime a host dies, also all the parasites that are carried by the hosts will also die. And so you have to uh, consider the morta mu plus uh, some alpha IPI, and uh, then uh, you, it should be included should be included uh, in, uh, in, in this equation. Now notice that here you multiply by IPI because whenever a host dies, all the I parasites that are hosted uh, by uh, that host will also die. Okay, so that's the, the equation. Now, okay, you can, we can now um, calculate the parasite load. Well, Pi P divided by H is the mean. And then you may uh, note that if you develop this term now, okay, it involves also the, uh, sorry, the um, square, no, sorry, the mean of the square, of the I square. Well, so, you may remember that it is the, the square of the mean plus the variance. Now, if we assume negative binomial, then the square of the mean plus variance can actually derive from the uh, formula that I showed to you before. And so it, it turns out that uh, it is P divided by H plus k plus one divided by k, k remember the clumping parameter and when the clumping parameter is low then there is a lot of over dispersion times p squared divided by h squared. So to make it short, you can get Anderson and uh, May's model provided you also introduce uh, um, a, a static equation for the larvae where if there are many adult parasites, they will produce a lot of larvae. But on the other hand, if there are a lot of hosts around, they will ingest the larvae and therefore the number of larvae in the environment will be lower. Actually, you can deduct this kind of, uh, find this kind of uh, static relationship. Uh, uh, if you also could add another differential equation for the larvae dynamics, and you assume that the larvae dynamics is so fast that in practice, you can uh, use the uh, a, a slow, fast uh, approach. Uh, um, um, and then, um, okay, you get this static relationship for the larvae. Now, if you plug everything in, you get um, the uh, celebrated uh, um, Anderson and May's model. Um, which is in practice, it's a simple system of two differential equations, H and P, um, which is closed under the hypothesis that the larvae have uh, this, uh, describe this relationship and that the distribution, the distribution of uh, the parasite burden actually follows a um, negative binomial distribution. Now, if you study the, uh, the um, system of differential equation as usual, for instance, by drawing the Isaac lines or linearizing whatever you want, then you find out that again, you can define a basic uh, reproduction number. And uh, in a way, the recipe is always the same. So one divided by M plus mu plus alpha, this is the residence time in the, uh, in the infectious, uh, infectious stage. And um, um, this, uh, actually is the number of, uh, say, parasites uh, that are ingested in, in unit time, okay? Now, as usual, R not equal to one marks a uh, transcritical bifurcation because, you know, uh, these green eyes of line can be shaped in this way. And, and, and this is, the, of course, the case of R not larger than one. So there is an endemic equilibrium which is stable, but then of course, it can also be shaped in this way that I is a in, in that case, R not is more than one. So again, uh, we see a uh, simple uh, transcritical bifurcation with R not equal to one marking uh, the, the boundary and the, the, when it, you switch, uh, and they, you have a bifurcation at R not equal to one. 
Now, what is it interesting that you might now say, well, that is true if the parasites are going to affect the mortality of their hosts. There is a very interesting study, and I, maybe you remember that I introduced that, that, that show, the uh, red grouse to you at the very beginning of part one. And um, uh, my good friends, uh, uh, Andy Dobson and, uh, and, um, and, and, and Pete Hudson, uh, now they observe that actually the red grouse have an oscillatory behavior. It is oscillatory behavior. Okay, and uh, they carry these um, intestinal parasite trichostrongylus steroids. Now, how is it possible? How is it possible to describe such a behavior? Because in this case, you, you do not get any permanent oscillation. Now, what they observed actually is that the parasites do not affect so much the mortality, they affect the fertility, the reproductive success uh, of, the, of the red grouse. So let me now introduce that uh, kind of, um, of um, hypothesis. And you see that in, in this case, mortality is, is not affected by, by um, by uh, the parasites, but it is the uh, fertility new, which is actually decreased. And the larger the number of parasites that one host carries and the larger the decrease in, in, uh, in, uh, in fertility. And then of course the parasite will die uh, from their own mortality, but they will also die when the host dies and the host dies with mortality mu, which is the interesting mortality. Now, if you go to the, this equation, this equation actually appear in a way simpler uh, with respect to the previous one. Notice that here you don't have to assume any negative binomial. Okay, you still have to assume that the larvae are uh, described by the static relationship. Um, when you study this very simple system of equation, what you get is, is something like that. And again, you have, uh, you know, this is the, uh, an isocline, and this is the other locus with the other isoclines. And fine. Okay. Now, the expression for R0 is this one. Now, you don't have uh, alpha, which was the mortality induced by uh, the parasites, the host. Uh, and, you know, what is interesting, if you look at um, the um, number of hosts at the equilibrium. Okay, now if R0 is larger than one, you have anyway an intersection. Uh, of course, R0 might be smaller than one. If R0 is smaller than one, this isocline is actually placed here. So you don't have any intersection, any interesting intersection. So you don't have a, a, a non-trivial equilibrium. So R0, less than one and you have only the disease-free equilibrium. As usual, at R not equal to one, there is a transcritical bifurcation. When this H star is exactly equal to K, then you have transcritical bifurcation. But what is interesting that if H star is actually smaller, much smaller than K, and you can actually prove that, that when it is smaller than uh, K divided by two, you have a Hopf bifurcation. So um, um, this equilibrium is no longer uh, asymptotically stable. It becomes unstable and surrounded by a limit cycle. So you see here, uh, what I told you, uh, that in, you can have Hopf uh, uh, bifurcation in, in this case. Now, note that uh, K, the carrying capacity, so the density of the, of the host, as usual, is influencing R0. So the more dense the population, the larger the carrying capacity and the larger R0. So you can make R0 uh, larger than one, and um, you have an, a, 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 an endemic disease because of, okay, uh, so the epidemics can is reasonable, easily established when the population is very, very high. 
think of cat raising or pig raising in a, in a, in a farm. And so they're, they're there. So of course, uh, it's easy to, to get a disease there. But if you look at the H star, H star does not depend carry capacity. So R0 can be larger than one, but it very much depends on the parasite fertility. So for increasing parasite fertility, you see H star is decreasing and therefore you have first a transcritical and then a hop uh, bifurcation. Okay. Now, it's time to go to um, schistosomiasis. Uh, no, first, let me stop and ask whether there are questions regarding this introduction. So the, there are currently no uh, question in the chat, but if anyone, uh, yes, there is a question by Alfonso, please. Alfonso? Uh, yeah. Hello. Um, my question is related with the, if there are uh, ec ecological explanation behind the fact that the parasite burden is distributed uh, like a negative binomial variable. Uh, well, no, I would say that, well, as far as I know, maybe I'm wrong. It's um, mostly an empirical, an empirical, um, an empirical remark that the negative. We know that 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 in most cases you have this um, over dispersion, um, and so the negative binomial is, let's say, the simplest um, distribution that can describe over dispersion. Uh, well. Well, let's say just... that, that, that in a way, like the, the story of the super spreaders that, you know, that like the, 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 the people that are super spreading uh, the same way, in, you might have uh, supercharged, supercharged hosts. Um, uh, well, it also depends on your immune system, of course, because um, because when you count the parasites, that's the adult parasites that you count. And there are two ways. Either you sacrifice the, uh, the host and they go and see what, how many parasites it is carrying, um, okay. Or uh, you purge, <laughs> if it is an intestinal parasite, you purge. So clearly um, the, the adult uh, also depends on the reaction of your immune system. So if your immune system is very, very active, so you might ingest a lot, lot of eggs, but the immune system is actually recognizing that there is a, uh, something going wrong in this react. And well, we know that the immune system in the different individuals responding in a, in a very, very different way. So, I don't know whether this is really an explanation. Um, I would say that anyway, it's mostly an empirical observation. You have, you have many different, uh, okay, cases like the one I showed to you at the very beginning, okay. And you say, well, uh, can, can I find something which is so flexible as to describe all these possible cases? In fact, you see that you go from K equal to six, uh, 2k equal to 1, 2k equal to 0.35, 2k equal to 0.038. And you, so with a negative binomial, you succeed in, in describing uh, all uh, this uh, variation of, of uh, okay, I hope I answered your question. <laughs> yes, yes, uh, I, I think that this, uh, I have another question, and it's related with the. We we are going to talk about uh, another models that account for different stages in the life cycle of the parasite more explicitly, or yes, or yes. Or, um, yes. I Okay. You mean that? No, I mean, schistosomiasis you see is, is, is even more oh, yeah. So I'm starting yes. from the simple, okay. the simple life cycle, with one on the, on the right, on the left. And then now we are proceeding to uh, 
the uh, actual life cycle of uh, in schistosomiasis where you have uh, two different hosts, okay? And then yes. you can have even more complex uh, macro parasite life cycles with um, uh, three hosts and, well, okay. Um, I think that Professor Rinaldo, for instance, might uh, speak up um, proliferative kidney disease in his uh, lecture, where the, the life cycle is even a little bit more complex. Uh, okay. Thank you. Uh, well, oh, okay. So can I proceed to schistosomiasis then? I think yes. Yes, there are no other questions in the, yep, please go ahead. So schistosomiasis um, is actually affecting many parts of the world, mainly Sub-Saharan Africa, um, a little bit in um, the Middle East and, and Far East uh, and South America. Uh, it affects um, uh, more than seven, uh, 700 million people, more than seven countries, in, um, at, at least potentially because they live in endemic areas. Um, more than 200 million people are affected worldwide, and every year there are several, several tens of thousands of deaths that might be ascribed to schistosomiasis. And 90% of uh, global infections are found in Sub Saharan Africa. Now, uh, sorry, before going into that, uh, now let me first of all show the schistosoma life cycle. And it is very similar to the one I showed to you for uh, fa uh, fasciolopsis. Well, <clears throat> the um, consider uh, humans and then uh, humans are actually infected because they um, simply uh, contact in infested water infected with cercaria. So the cercari can actually penetrate through uh, the skin. Um, and then uh, the adult parasites will develop inside, um, inside humans. Okay. And uh, they mate actually, so you have male and female. So you need a pair of, of, of um, actually parasites. And these um, will actually produce um, uh, schistosome eggs, and the schistosome eggs will develop into myracidia. This myracidia will infect snails of um, different uh, genera, Bionfolaria, Bulinus, Sonco, Melania. Sonco, Melania is typical of schistosomiasis in, um, in, um, uh, in the Far East. And also the, the schistosoma is a little bit different. So you have schistosoma japonicum, uh, schistosoma mansoni, um, et cetera, schistosoma hematobium. And uh, the humans mainly will, will suffer uh, of urogenital or uh, intestinal uh, problems. Usually it is not a deadly disease per se, but anyway, it can contribute to uh, lethality very strongly. You can be infected several times. It's not that if you, if you get the, the disease that you will not get the disease again. You can get the disease. So you can get, be infected and reinfected. The, the treatment is simple, uh, but for, uh, for poor countries, although it is simple, it might be expensive, uh, and in practice, you have to take a, a vermifuge, uh, praziquanto. Now, we have mainly started um, uh, the problem of schistosomiasis in Senegal and um, Burkina Faso. Well, uh, and we started that uh, a few years uh, a few years ago um, with the team of Professor Rinaldo and also with uh, our friends in, in Stanford and, um, um, and then other French people working in, in, uh, in Senegal. So, uh, I will mainly talk of Senegal today. So first of all, let me show the local model that, that uh, you can make and then we will proceed to consider a more complicated model where you have a network. 
a network of, of nodes. And um, first of all, you know, what's important that here you have uh, the mixture of the two approaches. You can recognize the uh, uh, negative binomial approach, uh, alpha being the mortality due to the, uh, the parasites carried by the host. But now, uh, you know, you couple that with the snails. And in the case of, of the snails, they, they, you can treat that as a microparasitic disease. So you divide the snails into susceptible snails, exposed snails. So these are infected, but not yet infectious and infectious snails. And so then you come out with a uh, five uh, differential equation where you have a number of human hosts, a number of adult parasites, the density of susceptible snails, the density of exposed snails, and the density of infectious snails. Now, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, and then again, you can make an, an approximation that we made, the approximation we, we made in, in, in this paper, that the number of circaria have very, that the circaria have a very fast, um, a very fast dynamics. So you can suppose that the circaria, the number of circaria is simply proportional to the number of infectious snails. And the same for myrosidia, that myrosidia is simply proportional to the number of adult parasites. And if you do a bifurcation diagram, um, okay, you find out that after all, um, what you can get is something which is very similar to what I showed to you, but for the case in which the parasite was affecting the reproductive success. In this case, no, the parasite is actually uh, affecting the, the mortality of, uh, of, uh, of humans. Uh, but in this case, in this more uh, complicated case with the uh, schistosomiasis uh, model, then you have a transcritical bifurcation, a house bifurcation. You can study that in uh, a two parameter space with human infection rate and the snail infection rate, the two parameters. Um, so uh, in, in this case, you do the bi uh, bifurcation study uh, with respect to both parameters. And again, you get a, um, a, a transcritical bifurcation. So you increase the human infection rate, increase the infection rate, and go through a transcritical bifurcation. You further increase both infection rates, and then you have hop bifurcation uh, with this kind of, uh, of limit cycle. Well, the most interesting case is when you consider now a more uh, realistic, um, well, actually this is partially realistic, uh, meaning that uh, the value of the parameter will tune down the, on the Senegal and Burkina Faso case. But the most challenging uh, case was for, uh, came out for us in, um, in Senegal when um, uh, D4D, uh, D, uh, this challenge D4D, uh, by Orange and uh, Sonatel, data for development was um, launched. And in this case, uh, Orange is the, um, you know, uh, mobile, mobile phone provider, uh, mobile phone connection provider. And um, they um, put anonymized uh, data on, um, on phone calls uh, in, available uh, to scientists and ask them, okay, choose a, a, a problem um, of a social, a social importance that you might want to solve using uh, our, our data. And then we decided to, uh, to use the, those data for um, developing a model for schistosomiasis um, in Senegal. You see that schistosomiasis, you can find um, urogenital schistosomiasis a little bit all over uh, Senegal. And um, especially uh, in the areas, especially in the rural areas, uh, clearly you're more subject to uh, schistosomiasis when you live close to water. Uh, so agricultural areas, you're uh, more exposed to, to schistosomiasis. Now, uh, so, when you consider the network structure of the model, what do you need? Well, you need a uh, uh, high resolution population density that's uh, available via, via geographical information systems. 
Then a human mobility fluxes that um, uh, have been made available in a way by studying the um, phone calls in year uh, 2013. Then uh, people living in rural settings uh, and rivers, these are mo mostly ephemeral rivers. And then of course, the, the data on the prevalence of uh, urogenital schistosomiasis. Now, uh, first, first of all, we had to study human mobility from uh, cell phone data. So it's big data. Uh, there are about 9 million solitary mobile phone users. And um, uh, well, at the beginning, uh, we're uh, not, we were not given 9 million, actually 9 million um, users, um, but a smaller, a smaller uh, sample. And then because we were winning the challenge for health, uh, uh, actually later on, they provided us with 9 million, nine, really 9 million mobile phone users, not to name, of course, they are anonymized and they're collected from one year. And so of course, by, uh, algorithm, you can um, actually deduct mobility in a way. I don't go into the details. You can find the details in the, for instance, in our paper, uh, but it's, it's, uh, it's now very much used. Uh, uh, well, of course, um, now remember one thing, these are mobile, these are not smartphone in general. So they, they do not have a GPS, global position system. But uh, you know, you know where the position of, of the people by knowing the antenna to which they are connected in a certain moment. Okay. Now, um, these are the, re the results of study mobility. So for instance, uh, it's, it's very clear, uh, there are two big festivals where uh, the Senegalese go uh, to, um, to city. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. the Grand Magal de Touba and the Kazura Jab and in, in this very precise period, uh, okay. And uh, it's all, uh, and you can uh, really find them uh, easily. Uh, so for instance, this is mobility from Saint Louis, uh, a region that we have started, which is up to here. And of course, most of, of the people stay home the, within region mobility. But then, uh, okay, they can move to other uh, to other to other uh, departments, uh, and uh, here you see the Gamud of Tiva uh, Kazura Jab, and um, the Grand Magal de Tuba. Okay, so we are uh, rather confident that the um, we can um, find mob uh, mobility in this way. Now, if you look at the model, it is similar to the, the local model I showed to you. Uh, but it, it's even more complicated um, because now we are also modeling uh, Circaria and Miracidia in each location I. And then not only that, but uh, the host in location I can, uh, they are also divided into a host carrying zero parasite, a certain number of parasites, the maximum number of parasites. So actually, you know, it's, uh, it's more complicated with host uh, having zero parasite and then be infected and getting one more parasite and so on and so on. And then, uh, okay, the core in a way, oh, I'm sorry, the core of course is the human mobility matrix because the, the disease is spread by people moving and uh, people move in and therefore they can have adult parasite uh, and then release uh, uh, the Miracidia somewhere else where they go or they go somewhere else, get uh, infected in, uh, in, uh, in the place where they do not live um, uh, usually and then come back and infect their home place. So, Okay, so it, uh, it's complicated now because the force of infection and the rate uh, of freshwater contamination will depend on that matrix uh, Q, uh, Q. And so you have QIJ and QJI. I go to J or uh, coming back from J and going to I. Okay, so exporting or importing uh, the, uh, the disease. 
So uh, you can now uh, run that model. Of course, part of the parameters are actually uh, known in a way measured, and some of these parameters have to be um, estimated. And so here are the results. The calibration is performed against the reported prevalence in each region, in each region. And here is, in a way, the fit. Uh, these are the prevalence data. These are this is the uh, prevalence calculated by the model. Of course, if it were perfect, you would stay on the 45 degrees line. Uh, but anyway, it's um, a reasonably good fit. Now, you can do a sensitivity analysis uh, with respect to the mobility of people. Uh, by mobile people, we mean the percentage of people that might move away from their own, from their own uh, region. Uh, of course, most of the people stay in their own region. Um, one of the, the uh, uh, 14 regions in which you can divide um, Senegal, uh, administrative region. And you see that the, um, okay, the prevalence uh, corresponding to the mobility that we estimated is actually more or less at the minimum. And then um, the average parasite burden is about seven, seven um, parasites per, per human. That's the average parasite burden. Now, when you have a model like that, then you can say, well, uh, what can I do? Can I, prevent the disease in some way. And there are different uh, intervention strategies that you can think of. So first of all, you might um, have um, uh, so-called wash strategies, water, sanitation, and hygiene, okay? And then information, education, and communication strategies. So you say, children, please be aware, don't go uh, play in, uh, in that river, in that canal, because that canal by being infested by snails, snails will release circaria, the target can penetrate your skin. Or if you go there, wear boots, for instance. Well, difficult to think that children wear boots and gloves, but anyway, okay. Uh, and then uh, you can distinguish between uh, uh, what we call, um, Untargeted strategies, so you try to uh, ameliorate uh, sanitation everywhere in, in Senegal, or you can have uh, targeted strategies that might be prevalence targeted, where the prevalence is larger, then you uh, um, put more sanitation, or risk targeted. So, for instance, this that is a rural and um, water is scarce there, maybe, or depending on that. And you see that for wash strategies, it is better to have uh, targeted strategies, while for information, education, and communication, well, it's rather intuitive, untargeted strategies, those strategies that are aimed at informing people all over the Senegal in a way are better in terms of reducing the average and the maximum prevalence. Now, give me five more minutes to say that then uh, we have also started um, uh, with people, to, with friends at Stanford uh, who carry a, a program on um, the region of Saint Louis, uh, which is located here near the Senegal River, the northern part of Senegal at, at the border with Mauritania. And um, uh, that we are carrying on that uh, program uh, is also being financed by Polytechnico de Milano, and there are you know a lot of lot of people actually collaborating. Um, uh, um, with, uh, Amadou, I mean uh, Tour, who also spent a period with us in uh, Polytechnico, and then went back to to and then um, uh, master students. Um, and then, um, the, for instance, Gilles Rivaud, the epidemiologist, um, uh, who's actually doing the, um, the work in, in Senegal, in Brahim Diallo, and uh, uh, Lamine, and so on. Okay. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the, by the way, that is Professor Casagrande in Senegal, you know, he's wearing gloves and boots, of course, and this is Lamine, I think, I'm not sure. Okay, they are wearing uh, boots and, and gloves because it would be very dangerous to, to, to go there because you see the, the small snails, these are the small snails that are releasing the circaria. 
Now, in this case, we went more in details because you see there are villages, okay, the triangles, phone antennas, but they're not all located in villages. Some of them are located in between the villages. And then the sample points, and then the water point, the water points. So, you know, we developed a more complicated, uh, uncomplicated model where you have several connection matrices because you have some matrices describing the probability that the snail or the circaria or a, a, or a mirror, mirror city moves between any two water points using the hydrological network, which you didn't use for the whole Senegal actually. The antenna to antenna mobility matrix. Then uh, the, uh, another matrix describing the village to antenna movement. Uh, well, not really movement, but you, you, you see you have to decide that that village is actually connected to that antenna or another antenna. And then another matrix describing the proximity of water points to antennas. Okay, so it's a complicated. So we introduce all that. And then we, uh, uh, the, the, so this model now includes several transportation uh, mechanisms and we, we, we found a reasonably good agreement with prevalence data in people. Unfortunately, prevalence can be very high. Um, um, all over, especially um, along the, um, this lake um, and also the canal and then the river, it can, it can mean, you know, uh, in some um, places the children might have, the 80% of the children might have blood in their urine. So it's really, uh, you know, a, a big problem in, uh, in rural areas. And uh, I hope that in this way, we have somehow contributed to the fight against the schistosomiasis. And um, well, I think that's the end uh, of my time. But of course, if there are questions, I'm willing to answer. And uh, of course, I would like to, to answer your questions. Yes, so there is a, uh, indeed a question from the chat. Um, how do you account for the infection occurring somewhere else, but reported in the uh, patient home? For instance, infection happening in San Louis, but reported in Dakar. In Dakar, no, the infection that are, are reported, uh, they, they, the infection of course are reported at home, because these are actually, if I well remember, the so-called uh, these are the so, uh, sanitary department, and these are the regions. So uh, of course, usually you get sick uh, at home. I mean, if you if you, if you travel, then uh, okay, so you can make that approximation. So you uh, you you report home, but then if you go to the, um, of course, to um, you can get um, well. You stay. You are each host um, stays in uh, a location I, which is the home. And uh, the home actually, how, how do you find the home of uh, a, a phone user? Well, usually most of the time, the phone calls at evening, the most frequent um, phone calls at evening are usually attributed to home. So you can say well, that one of those uh, 9 million users, that, that the home is this one. And then usually uh, he or she gets sick at home. Okay, so they're attributed to home, but they can get the infection somewhere else. So they might go somewhere else, be infested by Sertaria somewhere else. And they come home and, uh, well, usually they re release Miracidia in their own uh, water body or sewage system. Okay. So, yeah, that's the Yes, there is a um, partially related question, which is uh, in the last part, how do you account for under reporting, under reporting in prevalence data? Well, okay, the data on prevalence um, were directly uh, collected by Gilles Ribou. Okay. So it was careful, so, uh, by Gilles and Lamy. 
Villa and Lamin were actually conducting their own, at least in Saint Louis, in Saint Louis, they were conducting their own uh, campaign uh, looking at the prevalence. So the prevalence I have showed, I have shown to you. This one is, is actually the prevalences that were measured. So we are rather, um, well, let's say, that hopefully under reporting is not high at this point of the region. Yeah. Any other questions? Yes, um, there is no uh, other question in the chat. Uh, if you um, have any, if anyone has any question, please uh, raise uh, hand with the tool you are, I'm sure, now familiar with. Um, okay. Uh, I don't think there is uh, any other uh, question. Oh, everything very clear or very obscure. No, uh, the, there is another question uh, about how uh, and try to interpret it is how about um, uh, how did you infer mobility from the phone uh, record? Okay. Uh, well, first of all, as as I told you. Um, Okay, uh, now there are very, very, very many algorithms around um, to reduce probability from phone calls. Now, of course, if these were smartphones and um, the GPS were on the global positioning system, that uh, would be uh, in a way easy to like. Um, in this case, um, uh, unfortunately, <laughs> that you, you don't have always to use a smartphone, but you can use a normal uh, mobile. And, and maybe you have a smartphone, but you, you don't uh, switch on the, the GPS, the global position system, um, because you don't want to be located uh, in, in any minute of your life. So in this case, you know, um, it is the antennas that we know. So we know that uh, um, in the, one of, of the users at a certain precise moment was connected to a certain antenna. And of course, the density of the antenna is not the same all over Senegal and not all over Italy or all over France or uh, everywhere, because uh, of course there are more antennas in urban settings uh, and uh, uh, fewer antennas in a, in a rural setting. So, for instance, if you go to uh, Saint Louis, uh, these are the uh, location of, of the antennas. So you see that sometimes they are close to a village, and, and sometimes they're not even close to a village. Um, uh, also, it, it might it might be possible, you know, that there are many antennas at the border with Mauritania. Okay, that probably because they 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 are uh, trying to not have people connected to antennas in Mauritania. Okay, or something like that. Anyway, so what, um, uh, now, um, so first of all, there's, there's a problem that you have to attribute antennas to uh, villages, for instance. Okay, and you can do that by uh, the usual algorithms that, that are also used by hydrologists uh, that, uh, where the, uh, they have to reconstruct, for instance, the uh, rain precipitation and so on. Okay, so uh, for instance, they use the polygon method or uh, something like that. Okay, first problem. Then uh, you can attribute um, home to uh, the place, uh, or you should say the antenna, and then uh, the village uh, uh, where you connect most frequently in the evening get that, that the assumption, okay? And then of course you can reconstruct, you, you, for a certain user, you can track the different antennas through which the user is going in different, uh, uh, at different times, okay? So home and then, uh, so these guys stay uh, usually here, 
And then, uh, well, I will see that uh, corresponds with the Grand Magal de Tuba. He's there. Okay, because the, the using the phone and uh, and that that phone is not connected to the home antenna, but it is connected to, to the antenna close to, to the Grand Magal de Tuba. Okay, and then uh, he or she will come back home. Okay. And so, therefore, this is the way that you can reconstruct, uh, for instance, uh, all, uh, all this. And then, of course, the, we uh, because, and then we took the averages to describe um, the yearly the yearly uh, mobility in a way. But you can do more than that. You might run the model, not on a yearly basis, but uh, also more on a daily basis. On a, I don't know whether it would make sense because it would be too huge and uh, the epidemiological data are not so detailed. Okay, hope I, I'm sorry, I think time for the next uh, speaker probably. Yes, I think we are perfectly on time. So uh, thanks again to uh, Marino Gatto for giving this uh, fantastic lecture. So uh, next, next lecture is gonna be about uh, again models in disease ecology, but applied to uh, COVID-19. Um, so yes, it will be on Wednesday, that right? Yeah. Yes, let me check uh, on, uh, yes, it will be on uh, Wednesday to third Italian time. So uh, thanks again, Marino. And uh, what we're gonna do is to take um, a short break uh, and we are gonna be divided in breaking rooms and we're gonna start again in 15 minutes with the lecture by Jonathan Levy. Thank you very much. Okay. Can you give a link to this lecture now to participants? Okay. Bye-bye.